Earlier this year, the horror community went absolutely batshit, and there were many reasons for it, right between Scream and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but this wasn't negativity or complaints that I was hearing. It was actually love being thrown out for what was being deemed an original slasher that pays homage to early slasher films. And the movie I'm talking about is A24's film X, which stars Mia Goth, Jenna Ortega, Kid Cudi, and many more. And there's tons of people in the horror community, I know, who deem this to be the horror movie of 2022. They absolutely loved it, and that's great, right? You're, you're allowed to love a movie. But I'm here to tell you that this is the most overrated horror movie of 2022. There are so many reasons for it, and I know on Instagram, as soon as I finished watching this movie, I, I kind of came in a little hot and just was like, X sucked. What the hell? It sucked. <laughs> but it didn't necessarily suck, per se. Like, it wasn't a bad movie. It wasn't a Halloween ends, in a, in a complete sense. It's just a super overrated horror movie. Like, there's nothing really that special about it, in my opinion. But before I head deep into my comments and thoughts on this movie, let's dive in and talk about X, which was directed by Ty West, and it's going to be the first movie in what will be a trilogy film franchise. We first heard about X in November of 2020, when it was announced by A24, and principal photography commenced between February 16th and March 16th in New Zealand's North Island. The majority of production took place on a farm in the settlement of Fordell, where a large barn was constructed as part of the production. I will say that the special effects of this movie were very well done. The prosthetics, the uh, practical effects, everything about it was, was very well done. Actress Mia Goth, she has double duty in X. She plays both Maxine and Pearl, the latter being an elderly lady where Goth had done some pretty extensive prosthetic makeup to portray the role. I have to hand it to her because she spent 10 hours in the makeup chair, then went on to do a 12-hour day on set. <laughs> and there was also constant touch-ups by the makeup artist to make sure everything was right during filming. So you gotta hand it to her for being able to sit in a makeup chair that long and then go do your job. <laughs> like, that's not even the job part. Even though I'm going to be going over this movie and discussing how I feel it's an overrated horror movie, I still want to touch on some things that I really enjoyed and that I think they did right. There's this scene in the movie where Pearl stabs RJ in the neck. It required the use of a retractable prop knife with a prosthetic neck that had a slit in it. This allowed the tubing to pass through the slit and provide the blood effect that we see in the film. The decapitation that we see shortly after, it was accomplished by using a dummy head of RJ along with a stunt performer and false floor. The stunt performer laid on his back with his head and shoulders under the false floor and a prosthetic upper body concealing the rest. Then the stunt performer twitched their body while filming the scene, which when you pair it with the severed dummy head, <laughs> it really gave this cool illusion that the body was still twitching after death. It really made it a pretty decent moment, so I gotta hand it to them. They, there is some creativity here with the kills. Now the film is based in the 70s. The set designs, costumes, slang, the filmography, all of it did a great job of screaming the 70s era. It really did. The score was definitely true to the era as well with songs like Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult, Landslide by Fleetwood Mac, though it just wasn't enough for me to give this movie the substance that it needed. X first premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival on March 13th, 2022, and was released theatrically on March 18th, 2022. VOD services got the film on April 14th, 2022, and then home release occurred on May 24th, 2022 by Lionsgate. The film was definitely successful at the box office, there's, there's zero doubt about that. It had a gross of $11.8 million in the US and Canada, then an additional $3 million globally, which brought it to a total gross of $14.8 million, with only a $1 million budget for the film. So obviously, right, despite my thoughts on this movie, these numbers are always a good thing to see. Because it means the horror genre is doing well. Right? If we look at the horror movies that came out this year, we look even at Halloween Ends, we look at Scream, we look at X, we look at Terrifier 2. All of these movies made millions upon millions of dollars on a minimal budget. To a filmmaker, this means that they're going to be wanting to make more horror movies since it's going to give them the biggest return overall. And the more horror movies that we see have successful box office openings, the better. Because that means we're going to get more horror movies. It's simple math, right? Like, if they make money, then they're going to do more of them. 
Now we're going to dive into X itself, talk about how the movie unfolds, and I'm going to give you guys a heads up. This movie is a porno that poses as a slasher film, in my opinion. I, I truly don't feel, I feel like X is a psychological thriller more than it is a slasher film. I understand that there's great kills, I understand there's slashing quote-unquote moments, but I would not, under any circumstances, consider X to be a slasher film. I would consider this to be a psychological thriller, if anything. So let's dive in, let's talk about X and how the movie unfolds, then we're going to dive deep into my thoughts and opinions on why I think this movie is the most overrated horror movie of 2022. So the year is 1979, when we meet an aspiring pornographic actress named Maxine Minx. Maxine's embarking on a road trip through Texas, along with her boyfriend Wayne, who's the producer. Fellow porn stars are with her too, named Bobby Lynn, Jackson Hole. Yeah, Jackson Hole. And the director RJ and his girlfriend Lorraine are also along for the ride. Their intention is to shoot a pornographic film during the booming theatrical porn market of the 1970s. And at the beginning of the movie, they were making their way down a highway, and I couldn't help but already make comparisons to other horror movies, which I never, it's never a good idea, right? You never want the audience to immediately connect a movie to another horror movie in the first like 10, 15 minutes. You, you don't want that because immediately the audience is going to say, oh, they're just remaking the same shit. They're just rehashing. They're just copying it. Like, if it's going to be billed as a unique slasher film, it needs to truly be unique. I'm all about paying homage to films and moments from previous horror films. I love that. I love Easter eggs. I love the homages. I love paying respects. All of it. Though, there's a difference between paying homage and copying someone's homework. Immediately at the beginning of the movie, I got Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibes. Right at the beginning of the movie, and it held with me throughout the whole thing. Like, they're driving down the highway in a van that is so similar to the one from the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that I was sitting there going, I swear to God, if they pick up a hitchhiker right now, <laughs> I am done with this movie. Like, immediately playing on that, immediately playing on horror movie tropes, it just, for me, it wasn't a very solid opening. So the crew ends up arriving at a farm, and the farm is owned by an elderly couple named Howard and Pearl. Again, this house... Okay, that is on this farm. Looks like it literally came off of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre set. Like, as soon as they walked inside this house, you see the walls, you see the stairs, you see how the house is laid out. Immediately, I thought they literally took it off the set of Texas Chainsaw. So my mind at this point is going to where it's Texas Chainsaw. I'm no longer engaged in this quote-unquote unique film because everything you've given me so far screams Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, that's not unique. That is copying someone's homework. Now, before they had gotten to the farm, we saw Bobby Lynn and Jackson become romantically involved with each other, and Lorraine isn't impressed so far with the content of the film, while her boyfriend RJ is trying to make this porno seem like some sort of serious cinematic masterpiece. But, like, it's porn. It has one purpose, people, and it's not to be a cinematic masterpiece. But anyways, I digress. So the group meets Howard and Pearl, who are an elderly couple that own the farm they'll be staying on. They have a guest house on the property where this group intends on shooting their new porn film, The Farmer's Daughters. Oh god. Howard is immediately standoffish when approached by the group. They head over to his home, they try to introduce themselves, he pulls out a shotgun on them. And we also see his wife Pearl is silently stalking Maxine from afar. After a discussion, Howard ends up putting the shotgun away because he realizes he, well, made an agreement with this group that they could temporarily stay on the property. However, it seems like the filming of the porno film is, uh, is kind of being done in secret. There's, there's not really any mention to Howard of what they'll be doing during their stay, which would make sense, all things considered. Like, what elderly man would want a porno to be shot in their guest house? Well, maybe they would, actually. Uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But at this point, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, they're going to try and film this porno film in secret in the guest house. So the group heads into the guest house, they get settled in, they start filming their porno, while Maxine gets invited into the couple's home by Pearl. Now, Howard's completely unaware during this time of Pearl's actions, the fact that she's invited Maxine into the house, and the fact that the two of them end up striking a conversation. We learn that Pearl laments her age, and she's jealous of Maxine's youth. She then makes an advance towards Maxine, which causes her to run like hell back to the guest house. 
Next up is Maxine's scene in the porno film. She's coming up to film, and Pearl ends up watching the scene from outside the guest house and becomes aroused. She then pleads with her husband Howard to have sex with her, but he refuses with claims that his heart is too weak. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment here, because this film is now going to get the Halloween Ends treatment on the podcast. <laughs> At this point, we're close to halfway through the film. Okay, at this point in the story, we're, we're pretty close. I think we're about 30, 40 minutes into, uh, into the story here. There has been zero kills whatsoever. And also, zero buildup as to what is going to happen in this story. We don't know anything. All we know is there's an elderly couple that owns a farm. There's a porno being shot in their guest house, and the elderly woman is horny. That is what we know halfway through the movie. And this is a unique slasher. Okay. Just double checking. Like, honestly, guys, I was so super unsure as to what was even going on here in the movie at this point. Like, I don't want predictability. I want to make that clear. Like, I'm not saying the movie should be predictable because it shouldn't. If it's predictable, we're going to complain and bitch about that anyways. But what it should do is obviously build to something, right? Have some kind of build that you can feel suspense for. There was zero build in this movie. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what they're building to or even a suspicion as to what they're building to. All you know is, oh, well, maybe there'll be a third porno scene in this fucking movie. Like, there's no build whatsoever. All we've seen so far is porn. Like, that's it. There's been some character development and the filmography is excellent. I will give them an A++ on their filmography because that's really, in my opinion, the only truly unique thing with X was the filmography. The way they produced the film, the way they shot their shots, those were the unique moments of X. The story, the characters, all that kind of stuff, not so much. Not so much. Just the filmography and the way they were able to really accurately capture the atmosphere and era of the 70s was great it was well done but that's it that's the only unique thing that i found with x there's no true plot here at this point in the film there's no real story progression there's nothing to create anticipation within the audience as to what's going to happen next these are things that truly make a slasher film great it's suspense it's anticipation sometimes even fear of the unknown which X has none of. There's tons of unknown. <laughs> there's, there's tons of unanswered questions, but there's no fear there. There's no fear of the unknown when it comes to X. So if you're going to have something that's unknown, you should make your audience afraid of it. But that's just my opinion. Anyways, back to X. So night falls upon the farm, and the crew settles in to relax in the guest house. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, it's nighttime. This is where the slasher shine, right? <laughs> like the nighttime. Let's get some awesome kills going here. Oh, wait, no, you want to talk about porn more? Oh, my bad. My bad, right, we're watching X. Anyway, so <laughs> Lorraine is shown wanting to shed her reputation as being a prude. That's really how the film portrayed her character, is that she's this prudish girl who is a little bit shy, maybe somewhat introverted. She doesn't take place in the porno film, she's just the boom operator. That's really what she spent most of her time doing during the filming. But now, she's intrigued by the film and she asks to participate as one of the porn stars. Her boyfriend, RJ, immediately opposes the idea, and he's completely against her being in the film, which, understandable, makes complete sense. He even goes as far as blaming the rest of the group for convincing her to even want to be a part of this in, in any capacity as a porn star. The group, of course, assures RJ that they had nothing to do with this decision in any way, and it's her choice at the end of the day whether she wants to be in the film or not. So RJ's got no choice at this point. He's got to film the scene of Lorraine having sex with Jackson. This sends him into a flurry of rage and shock because he now feels that Lorraine is unfaithful to him. Well, he ends up heading out. He ain't going to have none of this shit. So he ends up heading out with the intention of leaving the crew stranded on the farm while they're sleeping. However, he ends up being stopped by Pearl who tries to seduce him. Immediately, RJ turns her away, and she ends up stabbing him to death in that gruesome scene that I was talking to you about earlier in this episode, and he ends up, of course, being decapitated. Now, Lorraine and Wayne have noticed that RJ's gone missing, so they head out on the search to locate him. However, Wayne ends up meeting his demise when Pearl kills him with a pitchfork in the barn. At the same time, Lorraine ends up running into Howard, who invites her into the couple's home. He tells her that Pearl's currently missing, 
and asks if she can fetch the flashlight from the basement for him so that they can head out together and try to find Pearl. Now, horror movie rule number 326, never go in the basement. <laughs> like, however, it doesn't matter. She goes into the basement and Howard locks the door behind her when she attempts to leave the basement and then discovers a rigged corpse in the basement of a male sex slave, which can only be assumed to be for Pearl. But it may be for Howard, too. Who knows? Who knows? We don't, we don't really know who the male sex slave is for, but I think it's safe to say it might be for Pearl. So now the action's starting to pick up, right? So now we're starting to get some, some interesting moments of the film. We've gotten a kill, one single kill in this unique slasher film. And... <laughs> At this point, I was looking forward to more kills. The kills were decent. The kills weren't bad. Like, the practical effects were great. The creativity of the kills, they weren't necessarily bad. But when you have zero buildup and you don't really have a solid plot, I don't know, I feel like the kills are kind of meaningless. So Lorraine's locked in the basement, and Howard heads out towards the guest house where he finds Jackson. He asks him to help him locate Pearl now. So Jackson's about to fall into this trap. During the search, Jackson ends up finding a car submerged in a pond, which belongs to the male sex slave found in the basement. This can only mean the demise of Jackson now, of course, that he's found this. He ends up being shot dead by Howard, and it's revealed at that point that he is totally involved with these violent tendencies of Pearl as well. Now we've actually seen him kill someone, we know he's got murderous tendencies, he's part of this unique slasher. During this time, Maxine's sound asleep, and Pearl ends up entering the guest house and climbs into bed naked with Maxine. Maxine wakes up. <laughs> she ends up screaming in shock that there's a naked elderly woman lying beside her, which causes Pearl to run from the guest house, and Bobby Lynn sees Pearl running from the guest house at that time. Back in the farmhouse, we still have Lorraine locked in the basement. She finds a hatchet and attempts to use it so she can break down the basement door. However, Howard comes back, <laughs> and he ends up attacking her and breaks her finger, which forces her back inside the basement. Bobby Lynn, who had seen Pearl running from the guest house, ended up following her, and they end up outside a nearby lake. This is where Bobby Lynn tries to guide Pearl away from the water. However, Pearl gets super angry with her and starts accusing her of being a whore before pushing her into the lake. Very rich coming from someone with a sex slave in their basement. But anyways, this is a pretty cool scene because uh, this is where Bobby Lynn gets devoured by an alligator. Yes, an alligator. <laughs> Didn't know we could have creature features in a slasher. But apparently, the horror community is just going to let X get away with it. Like, see, this is, this is seriously one of the biggest things that pisses me off here. There are so many things in X that if it happened in other slasher movies, would have pissed the horror community off. Yet they're letting it slide in this one because the film has beautiful filmography and it's set in a time where slasher films were predominant and were at its heyday and glory. So we're just going to overlook everything that we've complained about in other horror movies in the past and just say, no, X is great, X is great. But this isn't a slasher film. There, there, there's nothing in here that screams slasher. Considering so far, there hasn't been any slashing. There's been gunshots. There's been decapitation. And an alligator eating somebody. This isn't a slasher film. It has no characteristics of a slasher film. And if you're going to turn around and say, oh, well, that makes it unique. They're doing a new take on the slasher genre. No, that's like saying, I'm going to go watch a paranormal film where there's no ghosts. Or I'm going to go watch a supernatural film where it's just a guy who went crazy. Like, if you don't have the element of a slasher in a slasher film, it's not a slasher. If you don't have the element of a ghost in a paranormal film, it's not a paranormal film. At the end of the day, I cannot stand behind X being called a slasher film because it's not. It is not by any definition or characteristic a slasher film. It's missing all the key components. Great psychological thriller, not a slasher film. Back to the story. So Maxine sees Pearl and Howard heading back to the guest house. This is when she hides under the bed to try and stay the fuck away from them. As they enter the guest house, the two of them start discussing the murders that have taken place, and then they proceed to have sex on the bed. Like I said, this is a porno film. There's more sex in this movie than there has been kills or any inkling of slashers. Maxine's hiding under the bed while they're having sex, and she ends up fleeing the guest house and heads over to the van where she determines that 
well, their tires are punctured, and sees RJ totally dead lying on the ground. So she takes a pistol from the glove box, heads into the farmhouse, when she hears Lorraine screams. Maxine ends up freeing Lorraine, though she gets blamed angrily by Lorraine for all the events that have unfolded thus far. Lorraine's panicking, she's running out, and in this panic of events, she ends up running out the front door, not noticing Howard there, and getting shot and killed immediately. Since when is a gun the predominant weapon of a slasher film? Since when? Like, yeah, okay, you know, Art the Clown used a, a, a Tommy gun in Terrifier, but it wasn't his predominant weapon. Okay, we've seen, you know, pictures of Ghostface brandishing a shotgun, and there's been previous Ghostface killers that have used pistols in the past. Absolutely, but not predominantly. A slasher does not predominantly use a gun. You know why? Guns don't slash. You don't slash somebody with a gun. That is why it's called a slasher film. Because they get slashed and cut and everything that comes with slashing, not shooting. Anyways, so Howard and Pearl, they start moving all the dead bodies around with the intent that they're going to be framing the crew as intruders on their property. And while they're doing this, Lorraine's dying, and she ends up moving, which actually startles Howard and effectively kills him from a heart attack. Maxine then finds the keys to the couple's truck and tries to shoot Pearl, but discovers that the pistol isn't loaded. So then Pearl attempts to shoot Maxine, who dodges out of the way, but the recoil from the shotgun blast causes Pearl to fall over and break her hip. <sighs> like, come on, guys. We're going to bitch about Michael Myers being old and frail as a slasher, but this is acceptable. This. A quote-unquote, and I'm going to say quote-unquote because I'm not giving it the credit, quote-unquote slasher film where we have somebody who's elderly killing people and then, like... All these people had to do to save themselves was push her over. That's all they had to do, and they wouldn't have died. Push her over and break a hit. Scary slasher. Like, come on, come on. All right, so let's end this movie off. Let's end this off. So Pearl is lying injured outside the house. Her hip's broken now. And she starts begging Maxine for help. Now, of course, her request for help is denied, which leads Pearl to berating Maxine. Maxine then runs over Pearl with a truck, and crushes her head, effectively killing her. Maxine gets away, and the next morning police show up at the farmhouse to retrieve the bodies. We then find out, which I guess was supposed to be a twist of some kind that has zero fucking meaning whatsoever, we find out that Maxine is the daughter of a fundamentalist Christian preacher whose speeches were frequently played throughout the movie on Howard and Pearl's TV. And that's it. That's the movie. And there's so many fucking questions. Like, ridiculous. Like, Obviously, that moment at the end there was meant to be some kind of twist. But what? Like, what, who gives a fuck? Like, what, so the daughter of a religious zealot is doing porn? Is that is that what Maxine, the third movie in the trilogy, is going to be? These religious fanatics going at her for doing porn? Like, I just... So many fucking questions. My first one was, what the fuck did I just watch? <laughs> like, seriously, what was the story? Like, I get the fact that it's, you know dealing and struggling with getting old and the changes that happen with your body and being jealous of youth and seeing a new generation being able to do what you did all that kind of stuff that's great that's great for a real feel-good movie not a good plot for a fucking slasher film i'm sorry i i don't think that story is warranted in a slasher film oh sorry quote unquote slasher film i gave it too much credit there like I mentioned before, I took to social media as soon as I was done watching this movie, and I asked people why it was so popular. I was told things like it's a girl boss film, which I don't understand considering the depiction of women in this movie, but anyways, uh, I was also told it was fun like any good slasher, but it's not a slasher. <laughs> and many of you even agreed with me that we just don't get it, right? There's, I know I'm not alone, which is... <laughs> It's, it's nice to know I am not crazy and that there are other people who are like, yeah, I just, I don't understand the hype. I don't get it. I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone. Although my favorite horror podcast, You Run Podcast, I don't know if you guys have ever checked out You Run Podcast. It's spelled Y-O-U-R-U-N Podcast. Check them out. Scott's a great guy. It's my favorite horror podcast. And he actually responded with some pretty good points on what made this movie so popular. For one, the movie's based on one of the most searched things on the internet right? Porn. <laughs> so that alone, in all fairness, okay, 
I see why, why it's increased in popularity. Also, the fact that it is an original horror movie, which it is, right? Though not in a way that really sets itself apart from the rest. It's definitely unique, right? We haven't seen a slasher porno, so it's definitely unique in that light. Some people also suggested to me that I should go watch Pearl, which is the sequel to X, and then re-watch X because it will make it more fulfilling. No, sorry, Pearl is the second movie, but it's a prequel to X, sorry, not a sequel. My response to that is that I shouldn't have to watch a sequel to a movie in order to enjoy the first one. Like, yes, a sequel is intended to expand on the universe and answer unanswered questions to try and bring some closure to the audience from the first movie, right? That's the point of a sequel. However, we were given nothing with X. Literally, like, all we know is there is a sex-craved elderly lady who kills people. That's it. How is that enticing to check out Pearl? The first movie, it should have given us something that will encourage us to want to check out Pearl. There needs to be enough curiosity in X as to what the fuck is even going on for a sequel to be warranted, but X had none of that. I'm not curious to check out Pearl. I, I, yeah, I have unanswered questions, but I don't give a fuck what the answers are, because they didn't do anything in the movie to make me care. Right? I don't feel any connection to the characters, I don't feel a connection to the story, so why do I care enough to check out the sequel? And I'm sure I'm not alone in that, and that there's others out there that are like, eh, X was mad, I'm not checking out Pearl. I may check it out one day, and if I do watch Pearl, I promise you guys, I will rewatch X, and then I will come back on the podcast and do an episode on Pearl, and then share any maybe changed thoughts I have about X. But as it stands right now, lackluster and meh. That, that's how I describe X. Like, I don't describe it as, you know, the worst horror movie of 2022. That goes to Halloween ends. I, I describe it as lackluster, meh, and overrated. Those, that's the best way I can describe X. Like, for me, this movie has a similar issue to Halloween ends. It's great to have epic kills and gore, but when there's no substance or buildup to them, it makes the kills completely hollow and meaningless. X is also very heavily reliant on horror movie tropes and setting an atmosphere that we've already seen several times before. I know I've said it a couple of times on this episode, the filmography was great. I'll keep saying that because I want to still shine a positive light on this movie for what it did right. The filmography of the movie was absolutely incredible. There's some really great shots, and they did a good job of emulating that atmosphere of the 70s. But of course they did. They literally ripped off set pieces from other movies like TCM and Evil Dead to create that atmosphere. Like, they didn't actually bring anything new to the table when it comes to set design and atmosphere. They ripped off old horror movies and called it a homage. They did. Look at the house. Look at the farmhouse. If you look at the interior and the exterior of the house, and then look at the house from the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie in the 70s. Obviously, it's not the exact same house, but this house was designed with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house in mind. It looks the exact fucking same. Inside and out. And then you go to the guest house, which looks oddly enough like a fucking cabin. And it looks like the exact same cabin that came out of Evil Dead. Like, as soon as they went into the cabin, I'm like, oh, now we're watching Evil Dead. Oh, okay. Like, like I said before, it's cool to pay homage. It's awesome to pay homage. You should definitely do that because it'll really bring a lot of happiness to horror fans. But paying homage is different than copying someone else's homework and calling it your own. Pearl, which is the prequel film to X, was announced in March of 2022, and we also found out that the film was secretly shot back-to-back -back with X, and was also directed by Ty West and stars Mia Goth as a younger Pearl, which is super confusing. I don't, I don't understand why they would do this. So Mia Goth plays Pearl and Maxine, and it's not like it's a situation of, oh, it's a supernatural force and they're really both people and one's back in time. No, two completely different characters played by the same actress. So now you're going to go watch Pearl and see her play as Pearl, when you just watched her play as Maxine, and in the story, that that's so confusing. Because now you're... you're <sighs> I'm sorry, that's just super confusing in terms of building a character and building a story to have the same actress play the hero and the villain in two separate roles. Like, this isn't Fight Club. <laughs> like... Anyways, I just found that super confusing. And there's also going to be a third installment, of course, that I had mentioned called Maxine, which is going to focus on the character in 1980s LA, which follows the events of X. All I can assume when it comes to the third entry is that it's going to somehow tie in with the religious aspect we found out at the last seconds of X. This doesn't interest me at all. <laughs> like, even with X being the overrated horror movie that it is, 
if it provided a meaningful cliffhanger that opened up at least some curiosities, I'd probably check out Maxine. However, there's literally nothing in X that has me curious, or even care about what happens next. At the end of the day, it's not the worst horror film ever created. There's definitely more movies out there that, that are worse than X. However, with the amount of love this movie received, I'm definitely considering it the most overrated horror movie of 2022. I hope you guys enjoyed my rant and my take on X. I know a lot of people liked it, and that's okay. Right? We're allowed to like what we like, and we're allowed to not like what we don't like. It only becomes bad and toxic when you start bashing other people for their views and saying they're wrong, or they're less of a horror fan because they don't have the same opinion as you. So I appreciate anyone who's listening to this that may have a different opinion than me. I appreciate you listening to this and giving my opinion a listen and a thought and a chance, right? Maybe I swayed you, maybe I didn't. But that's also not my point of the podcast. And that's something I want to touch on. When I talk about movies that I like, and I talk about movies that I don't like, my purpose is not to necessarily sway you one way or another, convince you to like it or convince you to not like it. My intention is to provide you with an alternate perception and perspective on a horror movie that you may or may not have. Right? You may have the exact same opinion as me and the same perception and perspective as me. That's completely possible. But it's actually more likely that you don't. And I like to give these alternate perspectives so that you can look at these films objectively and maybe have a different sense of idea surrounding it. Now, I'm going to make it up to you guys because I know last week I said that this week was going to be uh, Devil's Carnival 1 and 2 and that we were going to do something special for the end of Season 1 here. But that's going to be next week because next week marks the end of Season 1. That'll be two full seasons on the Cabin of Horrors podcast, which is pretty freaking cool if you ask me. It's been a great year. Thank you guys so much for listening. So next week, I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek. We're going to be going over The Devil's Carnival 1 and 2, and also we're going to be talking about my favorite horror movie actor, Bill Mosley. We're going to be talking about his origins, a little bit about what movies he's been in, and why I really dig the guy, and why I think he's a solid dude overall. So make sure you tune in next week to the season finale of season one on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. And until then, guys, see you in the shadows.